Uh, good evening once again, uh, my dear, uh, you know, young innovators uh, from uh, GIT, and uh, thank you, GIT uh, administration, to connect us on NXP Campus Connect uh, platform. And uh, special thanks to uh, Professor Swetha, ma'am, you know, for uh, connecting us uh, with NXP and NXP Campus Connect program. And uh, just a brief intro of uh, this, uh, what this platform is. Uh, so every first Tuesday, we are sharing VLSI related topics. One of our, you know, uh, innovator connect on this platform and sharing more details about the topic. And on every third Tuesday every month, we are going to share the topics related to the system engineering. So as you know, today is the first Tuesday. So uh, we are here with the VLSI topic. Today we have you know, a senior member of uh, NXP India senior leadership team, uh, Dr. Rajiv Kumar Srivastava, visible on the screen. So, uh, uh, Rajiv ji, welcome to this platform. You are, you are, you know, the uh, the great leader who is supporting all these uh, great initiatives. Maybe few words from your side about uh, NXP India initiatives, and uh, few words. You know, we have young uh, students here from uh, JP Institute of uh, information and technology. So over to you, Rajiv ji. Yeah, thanks, Manish. So I hope I, I'm audible. Yes. So welcome to all participants, both uh, in the hall I can see here and uh, online. So, you know, I mean, NXP has a big history. I mean, it's 60 year old company. And, uh, you know, uh, NXP started from Philips and then later a spin off as an NXP semiconductor as a separate identity. And parallelly, uh, we have Freescale, which started from Motorola and a spin off as semiconductor company as a Freescale. And then they both merged together in 2014 to become the NXP. And, uh, you know, we have, I mean, it's, uh, we have 30 operations, uh, 30 countries worldwide, we have uh, operations for NXP. And uh, also, uh, uh, we have around 34,000 employees uh, with a headquarter in Netherlands. We have some light fabs also, old technologies in US, Netherlands, and Singapore. But the most important thing for NXP is that we have 9,500 patents granted. So we are actually innovating up there. That's the most important thing. And it's the portfolio is wide. It's not focused to one particular domain of uh, VLSI. So it's automotive, industrial, mobile, smart home, smart city, communication infrastructure. We cater all. And we have uh, approximately an annual revenue. Latest is $13.2 billion. And of course, the most important part among all, apart from innovation, we always focus on total quality. And that makes us different uh, in the uh, all the industries and that's the reason why we are so successful in automotive part now let's move to nxp india so nxp india also has around uh, 3000 permanent employees with 800 additional contractors and we have two big sites noida and bangalore and two medium to small size uh, sites pune and hyderabad so we are in india also we are widely distributed you can see and if you see India, uh, we have presence of all the business lines, NXP global business lines. And we have, we, we do the activities, of course, the SOC design, the digital IP design, the mixed signal IP design, foundation IPs, means uh, basic standard cells, design flows, PDK, system level design, embedded software, EDA development, because we have our own tools, and of course, some sort of applications or um, uh, software as well. So because you know nowadays you cannot sell a chip without a software so we have to make it now the second part which is most important that nxp india is also involved in a lot of initiatives for uh, for uh, i mean as the india for india as a country so this program campus connect it is one of the uh, uh, I, I i think it's one of the best program i have ever seen i worked in other companies earlier but this is a fantastic thing to 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 share the uh, experience of uh, uh, industry people to our uh, uh, young um, uh, engineers. Then also Manish himself is very instrumental in opening labs in various engineering colleges, and that is also going pretty well. So again, thanks to Manish because apart from Campus Connect, he is taking uh, he is involved uh, too much in uh, India-based activity. 
Then the third point is very important that we are funding three startups every year, uh, I think since 2021. So, and, and this year you will be surprised to know we got 288 applications from different startups. And uh, uh, our whole NXP India um, uh, um, uh, teams sat and reviewed all 288 startup content and their deliverables. And then we selected 12. And then among 12, we selected top three whom we are uh, uh, funding, supporting by all means. It's not only funding, we are uh, supporting also in terms of any help required, technical. And that we are doing for last three, four years. And you will be surprised to know that even our uh, uh, telecom uh, 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 IT minister, Mr. Rajiv Chanshekar, was highly impressed. And he said that, uh, I believe in your selection process of a startup. And he said, I will pick the rest of the uh, nine companies uh, uh, to fund uh, to fund them through government of India. So that's the uh, uh, thing we are uh, putting. It's a lot of energy involved. Eh? Selecting uh, among 280 is not an easy job. So that's what we are doing. Apart from that, uh, we are also part of ISA, which is Indian Energy Storage Alliance. So that is basically for electric cars, all the not only cars, but all the two wheeler, four wheeler based on the battery. And uh, NXP is one of the key uh, leaders in this association, uh, uh, putting all the standards together. And apart from that, of course, we do a lot of campus hiring. We hire a lot of interns. We train them. Some of them stay with us. Some also go outside. So yeah, we are into a lot of services also. Now, uh, I think today we have uh, uh, you have a very uh, important um, uh, topic uh, which uh, our guys are going to discuss um, the physical design and STA. This is one of the key part of the soft design, any chip design. So uh, I think uh, with that, I will stop and uh, uh, I will uh, let you enjoy this session with our uh, highly skilled technical experts. Over to you, Manish. Thanks, Rajiv ji, for your kind words. And yes, uh, our students are very motivated with the NXP work. And yes, uh, next time uh, there will be few startups from this college also, which you know we have to review and we have to fund them. Yes. Thank you, Rajiv ji, for your time. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Professor Swetha ji, uh, few words from your side. Your video is not visible now. I don't know why. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. But not visible on the screen. of this campus connect program of NXP because uh, we have now started uh, new programs on DLSI as well. As we all know uh, here that JIT, uh, Department of EP at JIT, it was founded in 2002. Programs, one, we take in uh, DLSI design technology and another one we take in advanced communication technologies as well. Also, we have a very strong backing of DLSI. We have around 30 faculty members working in DLSI domain and around 150 uh, publications every year from the industry. So this is the area where we have been working, but yes, we could not connect with NSP till they. I hope this would be an initiation for our connection with NSP. And we are looking forward to have many more events, many more associations with you as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. You may proceed. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for your kind words. And uh, yes, uh, NXP is always there. This is the first step of collaboration. And uh, going forward, uh, we will extend all our you know, uh, support, whatever is possible uh, from NXP. 
So today, as you know, uh, Rajiv ji suggested, today's session is uh, on uh, VLSI topic, which is physical design and STA. Very important, uh, you know, uh, uh, domain uh, in the SOC uh, design and development life cycle. And uh, we have two presenters visible on the screen, uh, Rupesh and Puneet. Rupesh is our, you know, uh, key leader, having uh, 17 plus years of experience in this domain. And uh, uh, his role, you know, includes uh, the design enablement and uh, engaging in different other SOC design activities. Puneet is also, you know, key uh, uh, guy in the SOC implementation, and uh, he worked on a lot of microprocessor and microcontroller designs, having 14 plus years of experience in the different domains. He is basically our senior principal manager in uh, uh, engineering uh, department. MMED is basically microprocessor and uh, microcontroller engineering uh, team. So, uh, you know, uh, without, uh, you know, investing much time, uh, over to you, uh, Rupesh and Puneet, and uh, we will start uh, today's session. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Okay. Over to you. Thank you, Manish. Uh, thanks, Rajiv, for also sharing the rich history of Phoenix P and what we are doing uh, as a company at worldwide and India level. Uh, so as Manish uh, uh, mentioned, so we'll have today two sessions. Uh, first one from my side covering on the physical design part, introduction to PD and second session, second half of this uh, 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 meeting would be on the static timing analysis covered by Rupesh. So yeah, let's get started. So first of all, before we go into uh, the details, right? Uh, just a quick glance on agenda. One of the topic which we'll be covering is in terms of chip design flow. Where does the physical design lie in terms of chip design flow? Then we will deep dive into flow planning fundamentals, placement, clock tree synthesis, which we call in short form CTS and the routing. So all these topics will be covering in details. So yes, uh, in terms of SOC design flow or chip design flow, what we call it, what is the first step? First step is to gather all the architectural requirements, design requirements. What does the end product demand from us, right, as an engineers? So ADD is prepared, which is architectural design document that mentions all the use cases, all the system level requirements mentioned. Then RTL team comes into picture where they take this spec, they code their RTL in Verilog, VHDL, as you might be hearing. Then the input comes to physical design team and our responsibility is to take the RTL, which is uh, in a behavioral code, you can call it, and generate the GDS, which then goes to FEB, to TSMC or to Samsung Foundry or to various foundries which are available worldwide. And they uh, fabricate the silicon. And after the silicon is made, it is being packaged so that it can be sold to the end customers. So this is at the broader level. Now, if we go into one more level of physical design, how we generate the GDS. So the first step is synthesis. As soon as we get the RTL behavioral code uh, from our integration team partners, we do the synthesis. We'll discuss briefly uh, in the upcoming slide what does synthesis mean. Then we do APR. APR stands for auto place and route. So basically this step is mainly covering all the physical design uh, um, parameters like um, like I covered in previous slide, flow planning, placement, CTS, routing. Then we do STA, uh, which is static timing analysis to make sure that performance of the design is meeting, let's say in terms of frequency target, in terms of whole time requirement, those are meeting. Then we also check that physical integration guidelines are being met because our output physical designs output goes to fab as you know. Uh, so here we need to make sure that all the physical integration guidelines are also met. Uh, that is DRC, LVS so that chip can be fabricated. And as a APR team, we also involve in timing closure and PV closure. So this is related to these next two topics. But we also do partner with our ST team members and physical integration members so that our design, which we are delivering to the next step, is compatible in terms of um, ST and PV. So this is where we are going to now spend some time on. So from the broader picture, now we'll go to further next level. We talked about what is the API flow, where does the physical design stand, and then in detail what all things we do at the brief level. 
Now, if we talk about the flow planning, this is the first step. Now, before we go into detail, uh, as I was explaining in previous slide, we have got RTL as an input. We do synthesis. So behavioral code is then turned into the gates, the AND gate, NAND gate, NOR gate, or all these kind of gates and the wires which are connected to each other in terms of netlist. This netlist uh, we take as an input to flow planning stage and our goal is to make sure that all the macros, let's say uh, design has some PLL or design has some ADC or memories, they are being placed or arranged. If design is huge, can we partition it into smaller blocks? Then we decide on the locations of IO pads. Then we decide on the location and number of power pads because IO pads are more or less data communication power pads to get the power supplies on the die. Then we decide on how do we distribute the power? Do we have to distribute through the ring, through the straps? Those strategy are being de uh, decided in the flow planning target. Then we talk about uh, deciding the location and type of clock distribution. We'll talk in detail in upcoming slides. So these are the key goals of flow planning. Then uh, what is the end result or the objective of flow planning? Eventually we have to reduce the chip area so that our flow planning should be optimal enough that chip area is lesser so that the die cost of fabrication is also lesser. We minimize the delay. Let's say if one block is talking to another block, how can we bring it closer to each other so that we have a lesser uh, uh, you know, performance issues? Uh, and also, how do we reduce the routing congestion? If some of the uh, cells or some of the nets are, uh, you know, um, some of the cells are talking to each other, how do we place it nearby so that, you know, there is no crisscross also happening and um, there is no routing congestion? We'll talk again in detail in upcoming slide. So these are the key objectives of flow planning. Now here I would uh, just spend a minute on this slide. Flow planning, I would say, imagine as a, uh, let's say when we are buying an empty house, right? So we create some rooms so that we partition in our designs and for our comfort. And then we also make sure that, you know, all the fridge, microwave are placed in corner so that we have a space to uh, roam around uh, in middle, right? Similarly, just keep that as an analogy. Similarly, you can correlate in case you are very beginner to the physical design. You can, um, you know, correlate with that analogy. So now here, our goal is to place all these blocks at the border so that uh, you know we don't have any hindrance in the core area. In core area, basically, we are going to place the standard cells, all the memories, macros. We will try to see if we can uh, place it in the corner. We also have these blocks which will have block pins because eventually these blocks are also going to talk to the core area standard cells, right? So all the block pins should be facing towards the core area. Also, uh, we need to see that there are some small, small channels which are left out of, um, you know, after the uh, after the flow planning. So we keep some routing blockages or even placement blockages because these kind of narrow channels can be a trap for the um, uh, PNR tools, right, or PD tools. Because it might happen that one of the flop is sitting here, another flop is placed, uh, let's say here, or some gates are here, and there can be some to and fro routing happening in these channels. So these kind of bottleneck spots we need to identify and then block those kind of channels. And uh, let's say if we have some IOs, in this case you can see the IOs on right side. So we need to provide enough routing channels so that these IOs can be accessed. And also uh, in the end we also see, you know, the die aspect ratio is balanced because in upcoming slide, we'll be talking about metal layers also. So the goal is that um, aspect ratio of die should be balanced so that we get good amount of um, uh, core area, also good amount of horizontal and vertical tracks so that we can route those signals. I'll be covering in upcoming slide those details. So these are some of the basic uh, good uh, flow planning techniques which we need to keep in mind while doing the uh, flow plan activity. So now, um, uh, just before we go to placement, so I'll just give a quick recap. We have got RTL from the front end team. We have done the synthesis, got the gate level netlist, and then we have also done the uh, flow planning activity. Now comes the placement. So what? before we go into placement, we will discuss what is standard cell because placement is all about uh, placing of standard cells. We have already placed macros and bigger blocks in the flow planning stage. Now we are going to talk about placing the standard cells. 
because there are let's say uh, one lakh standard cells or maybe uh, much higher than let's say two lakh five lakh depending on design complexity number of standard cells can be much much higher and that we cannot go and place manually hand by hand like we did in flow planning where we placed macros and memories by hand right so now what is standard cell standard cells are by definition they are building blocks of physical design they can be coming uh, from you know either developed internally or they can be coming from external vendors like tsmc also have their standard cell library arm also has their standard cell library so a lot of vendors can also provide and uh, all this collection of standard cell is called standard cell library so eventually if you see right um, what exactly is standard cell if we go one more level down so you have studied you might have studied about and gate or gate or let's say flip flops or some special clock cells or even some physical cells like filler cells well tap cells antenna cells all these are uh, cells which we have studied right uh, and all these cells when they are being you know uh, developed as a part of standard cell they they come as a part of standard cell library so all these cells only we are going to do the placement also, there are various uh, multiple flavor, VT flavors, right? Uh, v threshold, uh, uh, you would have studied, right? So that talks about HVT, SVT, LVT, which is mainly, let's say this is low VT cells, right? So they are much faster, but they are more leakier. Standard VT is uh, are regular, which is balanced in terms of their speed and their leakage. It, of course, it will be a little slower as compared to LV, but their leakage will also be slow, uh, lesser. Similar way, HVT, where leakage is the least, but they are slower also. So there is a trade-off, which of course, you know, by design to design, it varies. If there is very high frequency design, we might have to use some low powers, low VT cells, which may be a little bit leakier, but we may be able to meet the performance of the design. There are some of the files which standard cell uh, library, um, you know, uh, that comes along with the standard cell library, which is like a behavioral model. For example, if we talk about AND gate, it will explain, okay, what is the function of AND gate? Output is equal to A into B, right? Let's say if A and B are input. Similarly, then physical views, uh, which is a left file, it explains that, okay, how is the, uh, you know, physical it is going to look, what is the X and Y of that AND cell, where the power will come, where is the VDD, where is the VSS? We also have the GDS file, which eventually goes to the, um, you know, fab. Then there are transistor level views, which is spice views. And also we talk about uh, timing and power view that AND gate is going to, let's say, consume how much power, right? How much leakage power it will have or how much, uh, you know, how much time it is going to take uh, when the inputs are toggled, how much time it will uh, take to toggle the output. So those kind of information in, is present in um, Liberty files. So now, uh, yeah. So here probably as you can see, uh, this is the symbolic view uh, right, of AND gate. And this is the schematic view in terms of NMOS, PMOS. This is the layout view. If you go further one more level down inside the AND gate, it looks something like this, right? So uh, as we talked, right? So if we see, as soon as we got the netlist, we did flow planning. We did um, now placement we are going to do. So here, what we are saying is, Placement is a stage of the design flow during which each instance standard cell is given its exact location, right? So here, all these gates, be it AND gate or gate, all the standard cells, we are going to place and provide its exact location. And later, once placement is done, we will go to routing. Which cell talk to which cell, how will the routing communication happen? That would be our uh, next stage, which we'll be talking in upcoming slides. So let's say in terms of input for placement, um, right? We get netlist, which we have generated after uh, you know synthesis. We have flow plan where we have done all our macro placement, memory placement, all the uh, big guys we have placed and ensured that core area is uh, nice and square and accessible to all the position. And in that core area, we are going to place all these standard cells uh, and then assign them the location. So the goal of placement stage is to assign a legal location for the entire netlist. If a block has one lakh cells, two lakh cells, all has to be assigned into a legal location. That will be done through tool, but uh, in APR flow, that's the beauty. If we give it to the tool, 
it may not do an optimal job in most of the cases because there are a lot of parameters to balance in terms of uh, uh, design convergence. Is the design routable? Can we converge it? Is the design meeting performance? Is the design meeting power? Uh, are we uh, you know, going to have uh, the least number of least latency, which we'll be talking about? So all there are many parameters, many balls to juggle at the same time. So we have to guide the tool at each and every step so that our end result is the most optimum design, which is the most uh, you know beneficial uh, or the uh, you know in terms of cost and in terms of the performance and in terms of the area. So here we will, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we will meet timing area and power targets, and we will also enable the detail route for all nets. So just wanted to mention one thing in this stage of placement, we are just placing the standard cells, but we will enable the router so that, you know, it should not happen that at the placement stage we have placed the cell, but it is not converging later. It is not able to route. So our placement should be such that later when we go to routing stage, it should be convergible. So now uh, if I uh, brief little bit more about, you know, what type of placements are there? Uh, one is the global placement and one is the detail placement. So in global placement, it's more about just placing the cells. All right, and uh, then we will divide it into bins and then try to minimize number of connections. So tool will see, OK, uh, these are the cells. Let's just place it, legalize it. But now what is the um, you know placement uh, optimal enough? As you can see in this image, right? The placement is legal. Probably it is legalized, but still there are way too many crisscross connections happening. When we take this database to routing, it may not converge. Right, and eventually it is not good use of routing resources, not good use, not the good physical design uh, activity. So what we would do is, we would make sure that it is most optimal in terms of connectivity also. So if you see on the right side, this is a good placement where we see everything is still legalized. Connections are also minimum number of wires. So this helps in terms of routing convergence. This also helps in terms of meeting performance. Right. Yes, so this this we call it as a detailed placement so that there is no congestion and also we try to minimize the violence. Now congestion uh, or placements can be of uh, you know multiple types. So uh, first the basic basic type of con uh, you know placement we have seen where we our main goal is to optimize the timing and optimize the congestion. But there are some designs where you know we have to give more priority to timing or more priority to congestion. So how does that work? So what we need to tell tool is that, OK, these are the cost components, area, wire length. Let's say if there is any overlap, which is the traditional method and the basic one. Now for some kind of design, let's say you have a CPU to close at two gigahertz, for example, right? But there are uh, uh, congestion wise, that block is not very critical, just as an example. Right? Then you would give definitely more priority to timing so that let it worsen congestion little bit, let it lower the cost of congestion within its limit so that later it should still convergible, but give more priority to timing. Similarly, if there is some block, Typically, if you see the uh, arbiter kind of block or star switches kind of block, which you might have studied, right? Those blocks are extremely route dense, right? But performance wise, they may be 100 or 200 megahertz uh, uh, frequency target. So in those cases, our priority will be to do congestion driven placement. So that congestion should not come. Tool should um, tool can spread the cells more. Tool can uh, you know uh, keep it far away, but still it should meet the condition and timing anyway. Targets are lower, so it should be meetable. So this is the um, you know trade off we have to do. Similarly, there are some things uh, related to clock gating and power as well. If some designs are low power intensive. So as a PD engineer, our task is to understand the design and then take a best call which which kind of you know target we need to take uh, be it um, uh, timing driven placement congestion driven placement and then accordingly uh, decide on our recipe let's say briefly if we talk about uh, timing driven placement right uh, yeah so if we see timing driven placement tries to place critical path cells closer to reduce the net rnc values and to meet the setup timing so eventually when we are saying design is 1 gigahertz or 2 gigahertz we want we are talking about the how fast data we can send and how fast launch path launch flop has given the data and capture flop was able to capture it right that's the 
uh, basic definition of uh, design performance. Now here RNC values takes a key um, uh, key consideration because if we have longer R values, longer C values, which will have more delay, more delay of wires, maybe there are longer routes it would also needs repeater in between because as you see in mobile towers as well right we have repeaters at every some distance because signal cannot travel infinite distance there are repeaters to refresh the signal similarly on die also there are repeaters which refreshes the signal and uh, there are a more detailed analysis where each buffer can let's say drive 100 micron or 200 micron those kind of criteria are there so if a cell is if uh, you know driver and load are sitting too far away that would in turn need uh, more buffering it would have more delay so for the timing driven placement our requirement would be to have the cells closer within a you know of course again the purview of design should be convergible we should be able to still converge it should not be like as you can see here here we still have things sitting close by but still there is a space it it is not like we can you know just brick wall everything like uh, you know like a wall so we should still be able to route the design if we talk about the congestion driven placement you might have heard right uh, many places what is congestion so uh, even without looking at this slide, I would, uh, you know, urge you to imagine this as a, uh, you know, literal meaning congestion, right? Demand versus supply, where demand is more, supply is less. So it goes in the same way. Uh, let's say any PNR tool will divide the entire flow plan or the entire, you know, placeable region into small, small global bins, which we call it as G cell. And as you can see here in one of the example that let's say if in each G cell, number of routing demand is three, but the supply is one, then we have an overflow of two. Uh, it's a basic maths, right? So similar way in this, this uh, concept is uh, spread across in the entire die where all the G cells, we see the crossing. If the demand is more and supply is less, we say there is a congestion. Now we'll talk about how does, how do we resolve that? Right? So let's say if we have a congestion in our design, one of the option which uh, we goes with the you know obvious uh, thinking is okay if there is a demand more supply less in one particular region why not use the another region where there is a more supply or where there is a less demand so detouring some of this is the congestion but what what would be the penalty on that because the net is detour as i was uh, briefing earlier also uh, the longer distance the more rc values we might need more buffering so it eventually it will have more delay right and um, yeah if there are some some designs which are completely um, not routable uh, you know in if, in case there is a severe congestion so it is important to minimize or eliminate congestion before continuing so there are various ways uh, today we may not be able to cover it but there are various various ways to resolve the congestion either uh, we have to spread some cells or you know we have to create some kind of uh, bounds for some of the cells but all these things comes under a big umbrella of demand versus supply how do we either decrease the demand in congested region or how can we increase the supply in the congested region right so all those uh, concepts are based on this. OK, so now again, if we just briefly go back, we have got the behavioral code from RTL team. We have done the synthesis to arrive at gate level netlist. We use that synthesis to do the flow planning of bigger macros. Then we did the placement of all the standard cells so that all the cells have a proper location, right? That includes all the flops and gate everything. Now we come to the CTS part, which is clock trace synthesis. Here, basically what we are saying is, let's say there is a clock source because all our designs, right? They consist of sequential cells and combo cells just to put it at the uh, minimum. All the combo cells and gate or gate, they can be um, you know, placed and they, they will be functional as soon as they get the data. However, all the sequential cells, they become functional when they get clock, right? So there is a clock dependency and that is one of the main input to the sequential cells. So uh, in we discussed about the placement. Now, if we talk about the clock tree, uh, so let's say this is a clock source, which uh, you know gives clock to all the sequential cells in the design. So as we know, combinational cells basically works as, as soon as they get data as an input and uh, it can generate the output. Uh, uh, please go on mute. Thank you. So uh, it can generate the output. 
However, for sequential cells, we need to have uh, input clock also so that it can you know transparent the data to output. So here in clock tree also we talk about you know the uh, by design if you see on left side all these blue color flops they get clocked from one of the source mostly it will be PLL or it can be from any other source or if it is coming from outside the chip it can come from pad also but yes just for simplicity we consider this is a point which generates the data and uh, to provide uh, which generates the clock to all these flops but how do we do the clock tree distribution we cannot uh, directly uh, distribute from the source right we need to have the repeaters and we need to have a proper tree build so that our latency can be minimized i'll talk in uh, upcoming slide but this is a sample of uh, clock tree network that there is a clock source it goes to one buffer then it branches out to two buffers and each buffer can again you know branch out to one one category or one one group of flops now, uh, before we go into little detail on clock tree, just few of the key things, uh, key terminology to note is one is clock root, which generates the uh, uh, clock signal. Typically, it is uh, PLL. Let's consider uh, PLL for our discussion. Uh, it can be a uh, second second terminology is about the sync pin, where we are talking about the flops mainly. Then there is an insertion delay. Let's say from PLL to the flop input, how much time it has taken for clock to reach because length can be higher. So delay and then there'll be repeaters also. So how much is the total time it has taken? Then also uh, there are hard macros. Let's say in terms of any hierarchical block instantiated uh, within given platform. We also talk about the buffers and inverter pairs to be used, the repeaters and the clock skew, which is the difference between the max insertion and min insertion delay. I'll be discussing in upcoming slide. OK, so why do we need clock tree synthesis? It is basically required to achieve the convergence between pre CTS and post CTS timing. So we need we have a flops. We have a uh, data data cells which has been placed in the design. But now we need to also route the clock to all the sequential cells. And what is our primary goal? Our primary goal is to minimize the clock skew from for, for timing convergence. I'll discuss in upcoming slide why is clock skew bad. Uh, let's say when we talk about and you know at the basic level, uh, uh, let's say for example for setup timing. So we'll just discuss in upcoming slide. Also as a secondary uh, goal, we need to meet the transition time check and minimize the insertion delay. Okay. Okay. So from setup time perspective, this is the most basic version. So I urge all of you, whenever you are imagining a die before going to a big 1 million, 2 million dies, uh, you can just imagine everything through this simple uh, flop based analogy, whereas one uh, data is coming, then there is a launch flop, then there is some delay during the part data part delay, and there is a capture flop. And here, if we talk about the clock, there's some delay on the clock network. Let's call it TCA. There's some delay on the uh, receiver flop or the capture flop network, which is let's call it TCB. And this is the delay of the data path. So if we see from, uh, let's say if the clock period is T, right? So the basic setup, setup time equation, right? TCA plus TP plus TD. TCA is um, launch clock delay plus TP is the uh, internal delay of the flop, let's say uh, the launch delay plus the TD, right? So this three delay combined, right? That should be less than TCB plus the clock period, which is T, right? So if we just rearrange this formula, uh, TP plus TD is less than equals to T minus uh, TCA minus TB. So I think all long story short, right? The main thing is, let's say, if Q is there, let's say TCA minus TCB. TCA minus TCB is nothing but how much time a clock take to reach this point versus this point. So any ideal, ideally in ideal world, we want clock should be reaching to all the flops together, right? But that's not possible. We have a network. We have different number of stages for each flop. So this delay also differs. So we need to strive to achieve the ideal, but it can be as minimum as possible. Similarly, uh, for whole time also, uh, we have, uh, let's say, skew requirement. Uh, probably I'll not cover in the detail uh, for each of this. It is same as the previous slide. But as you can see, let's say this skew, TCB minus TCA, should be less than 
TP plus TD. Right. So let, let's assume even if TD is zero, assume there is a no data part delay. Still, we need to have uh, skew should be less than clock to queue delay for a typical flock. Now briefly about the skew, uh, we have talked multiple times about skew, right? Uh, so how does how do we visualize? Let's say there is this uh, uh, diagram where there's data coming as an input to some logic A, then it goes to one flock, it goes out. Then clock is going to one flock, then uh, clock is going to all three flops. Then there are a couple of other flops which is getting input data from somewhere, but they also talk to each other. Let's say this flop is talking to the another flop. So skew is basically two types. One is global skew and one is local skew. Here in this slide, primarily when we are talking about global skew, it is the difference of clock latency between any two number of points in the design. So as you can see here, let's assume this T1, the time takes to reach first flop is 370 PS, T2 is 380 PS, and T3 is also 380 PS. So what is the max latency minus min latency, which is like you can say 380 PS minus 370 PS, which is 10 PS. Uh, yeah, max latency minus min latency is the skew, global skew, which is 10 PS here. It doesn't matter if A, B or C, they talk to each other or not. In global skew, we just do max latency minus min latency. However, when we talk about you know, the local skew, then we have to look at which flops are talking to each other. So as you can see here, uh, let's say if this particular flop is there, although it has 380 PS of latency, but they don't talk to each other. This flop launches the data and data goes out and gets the data from somewhere and consumes it, right? And then it uh, send it out. However, if you see at this uh, uh, flops in this blue color section, these two flops, the first flops gets data from somewhere. It launches the data. It goes through B and it goes through flip flop two. So if you you know recall one of the previous slide where I was mentioning about the setup time equation, it is important that you know the launch flop and the capture flop they have minimum skew. So in this case, uh, just for the depiction purpose, it is 200 PS for both of them latency. So you can say skew is zero in ideal world. So this is the preferable option. If it is not zero, it can be, let's say, you know, 50 PS, 100 PS. Uh, that much margin will have to, uh, you know, build during our um, ICC or, you know, in our prime time to make sure that we meet those paths. Eventually, that's the performance. Imagine as if, you know, one, one person is throwing the data, throwing the balls, let's say, to other person is catching, right? So the person, he's throwing 10 balls in one second, but the person who is catching can only catch five balls in one second. Then that's not a design performance which we are meeting, right? We want to ensure that. If a person is throwing 10 balls, the other person who is catching also should be able to catch all 10 balls, right? So that's the design performance we are talking about. Same thing, we need to ensure that the data which is coming here at the particular clock also is captured correctly at the destination flock. So yes, um, now coming on to routing. Let's say uh, we have done all the flow planning activity, placement, we also have done CTS. Now it's the last step uh, where we talk about the routing. Cells are logically connected, uh, right? So logically cells are already connected in the behavioral code. Logically cells are also connected in the net list. But like we did the placement of cells in the layout, you can visually do see, right? Similarly, we need to also uh, in layout connect those cells and make sure that their physical connection is present through a piece of wire. Right? So that is what we call as an interconnect which is a piece of metal which is used to make physical connections. A net is more, you know, uh, comprises of one or more interconnect which define an end-to-end -end connection. So let's say these are the three cells which are, you know, uh, it can be any combinational cell, sequential cell. Here we are mainly uh, concerned about how do we connect one pin to the other pin through an interconnect, through a wire. So let's say I draw one uh, wire, I draw another wire and I connect it. And then yellow wire also connects to another cell. So here, let's say this yellow color is the output pin. It goes and connects to two input pins. In layout, actually we do route. And ABC can be called as an in interconnect. So what is our goal for routing and what is our purpose? Right? So routing creates physical connection to all clocks and signal through the metal interconnect. Metal interconnects meet physical DRC requirement. 
I'll discuss in um, uh, upcoming uh, some of the notes. Also, the routed path must meet setup and hold time, max transition, max cap, and clock skew requirement, right? So uh, in summary, it should meet the design performance and also it should be convergible and also it should meet the physical DRC requirement. So what are DRC requirement, right? I think that query uh, typically comes as you might have heard. So DRCs is mainly to make sure that the design which we are doing is compatible to the fab also that let's say when we are doing some routing, when we are doing some uh, signals to be routed in, um, you know, nearby each other, will it create any short or open when it goes to fab? Today in layout in computer, you might be seeing that, okay, two routes are, uh, you know, going together, there's no short. But when it goes to fabrication to TSMC or to any of the fab, can it come so close that it may lead to a short? Right. So that's the DRC, one simple example. So there are various DRCs, min width DRC, min spacing DRC, min area DRC. Right? For example, let's say if we talk about min width, a wire has to be of minimum certain width. Otherwise, it may lead to an open because if it is so thin, thinner than this fab requirement, then they will not be able to guarantee that the wire will be intact. It may lead to an open. Similarly, min spacing requirement. If we place two wires very close to each other, it may, uh, during fabrication process, it may come together and it may create a short. Similarly, min area. Min area can also be uh, leading to opens. So these are some of the basic example of what are the fab guidelines because when we do the physical design and give it to fab, we need to ensure that our design is design is uh, you know uh, any shorts or open free or during manufacture there are no problems uh, faced by the fab. Now let's say if we talk about some of the routing basics, right? Let's say um, okay, let me just first open the slide completely. Let's say there are three wires, right? Each of them have a width of W, spacing of S, right? And we have many routing tracks like this because for uh, you and I, we know that, okay, there are routing signals, they have to be connected, but how do we give those rules to tools, right? Eventually, there are going to be millions of wires connecting to each other. We are not going to uh, do connection one by one, right? By hand, that will take us eternity. So PNR tools, help us achieving this milestone and they have routing tracks defined within their tool limits. So that helps them decide, okay, how far, uh, you know, uh, let's say if here, if you see how far I can keep two signals, let's say this S spacing so that, you know, later during fabrication, we do not see this problem of shorting or how much is the min width required so that it doesn't create uh, any opens during the fabrication and how many, you know, how I can route the signals vertically, how are the tracks which I can route the signals horizontally? So all these things we cover as a part of during our routing. So tool knows that, okay, if I have to go from point A to point B, I can go uh, horizontal, I can go vertical. This is the min width required. This much is the spacing I need to keep. So all these rules we give it to tool, which is compatible to FEB so that those routing can be achieved. Now, uh, now, as you imagine, right, uh, when we did the flow planning, it's so, you know, uh, we placed all the macros. When we did the standard cell placement, we placed all the standard cells, which eventually in inside the standard cell, inside the gate, let's say there is a PMOS and MOS, which gets all fabricated on the substrate. But what about the routing? Routing doesn't go on substrate, right? So routing, there are metal layers. Now, let's say if I have to go from point A to point B in horizontal direction, all connections like that, then I need only one metal layer. If I have some connections on top to bottom, some connections on left and right, I may need more metal layers. I definitely would need more metal layers. Eh? So metal stack is nothing but the number of uh, and type of metal layers available for routing because we have millions of nets, right? Today, if we uh, see our uh, roads infrastructure, right, we have... Uh, horizontal roads and then we have crosses which is more of you know per perpendicular road but we also have flyovers also similarly we have many many metal layers to enable that let's say if any cell is sitting on let's say bottom left corner of the die and it has to travel to center of the die how would it travel it is not possible to travel just in one or two metal layers we need multiple metal layers right because there are millions of wires 
so we eventually need more number of tracks some of them will be horizontal uh, uh, just as a thumb rule you can mention uh, half of the tracks will be horizontal half of the tracks will be vertical just for simplicity then uh, we have a technology which provides multiple options for metal stack let's say for example if we talk about 16 uh, nanometer technology we have various metal stacks possible nine metal layers 10 metal layers uh, 11 metal layers so depending on design complexity and need of uh, design how many metal layers require which you take a call but everything um, there's no free lunch right as we say so there is always um, you know cost associated with it we need to take a decision how many metal layers required uh, based on the design needs so that it is optimum in terms of cost. And uh, yes, um, that goes same for all the blocks in SOC. So just imagine there is a SOC, uh, you know, a, a chip and on top of that there are uh, 9 or 10 or 11 metal layers which is used for routing. So there, there are uh, metal layers stacked on top of each other and separated by dielectric. Uh, connection between two metal layers is the via. So let's say any signal which has to go, you know, from one metal layer to other metal layer has to take a via. It's more or less you can imagine like a lift. So let's say a horizontal signal is traveling and it has to go vertical. So it will come horizontal and then it will take a via and go vertical in the upper layer. I'll I'll uh, I have a slide to show that as well, just to um, you know, imagine it better. And the uh, yeah, uh, and then there is a connection between uh, the metal layers and also the substrate. So yes, so as I was mentioning earlier, so there is a cost factor involved. So there is a base layer which we call it, you know, where all the uh, gates and uh, transistors are going to be built. That costs much much higher as compared to the metal layers. So let's assume there are these two cells sitting, and these are two pins of these cells. How do they reach each other? One of the simplest method which we would think is uh, it, it goes in vertical, it goes in horizontal, just tap it in the same metal layer. Imagine we have just one metal layer. It can do it. But can it do for millions of signals? No, because if there is some cell sitting on top and one cell sitting on bottom, it cannot reach because, yeah, let's say there is another signal, right? Another two cells which are talking to each other. They cannot um, uh, talk like that because then there is a short. So how do we resolve this short, right? If we have one more metal layer, just imagine, right? And then this vertical uh, stripe, which is in blue color now, it is converted to the vertical layer, let's say in another layer. Then this short is resolved. As I was mentioning, let's assume there is a lift, right? So the below layer, imagine it in three, three dimension. Let's say the left cell is talking to right cell is talking in the horizontal layer and the bottom cell goes to one layer up do the vertical routing and then come back to the it's a destination cell. So that will resolve a short. If you imagine in uh, 3D, right? So there is a base layer. So this diagram which looks to you in 2D is actually all these blue color cells which are uh, in uh, you know base layer. This gray color things in metal one, for example, let's just say for you know, easier understanding. And this blue color thing is on metal two, you can say. So that way, every all three layers are involved. Base layer, metal one, metal two. So what type of routings are there, right? One is the quick route, where uh, we do the shortest path routing. Connections are made. And, uh, and then we do also layer assignment. And only basic DRC fixing we take care. That is primarily used during placement and pre-CTS uh, to check the design routing. Because if you remember, I had mentioned in the placement target that we need to check the convergence and eventually our placement of cell should not have any routing problem later. So one of the technique what we do is just after placement, we also run quick route to see is the design converging or not and is the design routable. Or if there is some congestion, we try to resolve it. Also, the quick route provides load for nets for timing optimization for congestion and also um, quick route it cannot be used to estimate the coupling cap uh, because th this is you know the dirty route and it is not fully drc clean as well so after doing the quick route we when we eventually after doing placement cts and routing when we go to the detail route here we look at multiple things one is we do the global route we see, uh, uh, you know, how is the overall connectivity? 
how is the you know design is divided into g cells are they able to talk to each other or do we need more tracks and when we eventually reach the routing stage there we actually lay down all the routes which um, i mentioned in the previous slide there we actually see the routes being created and uh, you know um, our tool divides the uh, design into multiple boxes just for simplicity uh, so that it is able to route because for tool also it has tools also works with some algorithms they also uh, like us breaks the bigger problem statement into smaller manageable pieces right similarly tool also does the same way it divides into smaller pieces they call it x box as boxes sorry and um, and then those are all connected and here we also do drc fixing so that you know eventually our post route database is uh, routable and without any drcs of course tool also cannot do all drc fixes it is not like after the routing stage tool will give us a uh, gds which can be directly given to fab we may still have 1000 2000 5000 drcs which we might have to fix manually or through some recipe improvements now uh, routing will also be of two types similar to placement here if we see uh, timing driven routing which aims at convergence of pre route and post route timing uh, it is also layer assignment is done in timing routed database timing critical nets are assigned less resistive layers so as i was mentioning during placement also um, that let's say there is some high performance design timing critical design we place cells closer to each other similar way uh, for routing also we need to make sure that they get upper layer uh, routing right uh, so that there is a less resistive layer typically as a thumb rule right all the lower metal layers are higher resistance and upper metal layers are uh, you know less resistance they are typically used for let's say higher uh, uh, timing critical nets or clock routing they are critical nets and mainly for power routing as well so so that we have least uh, resistance path for all these critical things and then we have si driven signal integrity uh, driven routing here probably i'll just briefly uh, say that okay it's more about controlling the coupling capacitance of these nets so that you know there's no um, coupling cap um, which leads to higher delay so uh, yes sir. so this is just one more uh, sample flow plan as you can see there are designs where you know multiple channels are involved there is some channel here there is channel here here uh, there are some channel here there are few notches also so these kind of notches we have to be careful for uh, routing because as eventually pnr tool also may get stuck here if we do not guide it properly so these kind of uh, you know bottleneck areas um we need to fix so it also works on the same fundamental if we give uh, garbage in to the tool it will give garbage out so how good quality inputs you can give it to tool it will revert back to you with the good quality output so uh, all these concepts we need to take care and uh, uh, last slide uh, on the pd side that after we do routing uh, what do we expect um we do see there are some timing violations jump after routing uh, because you know actual rnc values comes into picture there might be some detours tool would have done to fix the routing shorts and congestion related issues actual loads may differ some of the nets may get detoured timing optimization is performed after the routing similar to the placement stage after routing also there is a timing optimization performs tool will try to balance the cost and the optimization is this stage is limited to sizing and buffering and um, uh, yeah mitigation plan for pre route flow is mostly to scaling factors for load and extra uncertainty we provide for the timing so all in all um, before uh, you know we um, hand over i hand over to pesh uh, one thing is just imagine from the starting as soon as we get the rtl we do all the stages we convert it into gates very log code is converted to gates plus nets that goes to the placement of uh, you know macros which we call it as a flow plan placement of ios then we place the standard cells then we play, do the clock tree synthesis so that all the flops gets its own uh, you know good quality clocks then we do routing and in all process our main fundamental parameter is power performance and area how fast we can design what is the least power we can do in all the stages and what is the least area we require that determines how good design we have done
So with that, I would like to hand over uh, Rupesh to you to continue forward. Yeah, hi all. Uh, welcome once again to this uh, NXP Campus Connect. Sorry for uh, this trouble, sir. Excuse me, sir. Yeah, Lingraj, go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, PD's hearing is uh, low or uh, good, sir, uh, for the pressures. <laughs> so, yeah, one minute, up on this. Shall we keep questions for end? Uh, so, so yes. that we can, we'll take the QA. Yeah, so yes, all QA we'll yeah. take in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah maybe okay, you can type you your queries comments. in the chat box and maybe you know Puneet will reply online. And then after the session, we can take uh, QA. Rupesh, you please go ahead. Yeah, okay, so thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Puneet. Uh, it was really very good uh, introduction to physical design. So, yeah, in general, physical design where uh, the design spec description in the form of RTL. Uh, we convert it to a GDS form, which can be used by foundries to fabricate a real working circuit. Now, uh, we, we have the design in the GDS form, but how do we upfront try to ensure that the chips that will come out of the foundries, they will work as per our expectation? Uh, uh, Rupesh, we'll meet the, uh, Rupesh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, your slide is not visible. Uh, no, not sharing yet. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, I'll start sharing. Yeah, so uh, so to ensure that the chips that come out of foundry, uh, will we have some sign of domains like uh, static timing analysis, uh, power distribution network analysis, physical verification, or logic equivalence. So once the green signal is obtained from all these uh, sign of domains, then uh, uh, the confidence is built up in built up to uh, tape it out to the Foundry. So, uh, yeah, then uh, now let's spend some time understanding the timing sign off, which is also called as uh, static timing analysis. Let me start sharing the screen. Yeah. I hope it's visible now. Yes. Yeah, thanks. So, basics of STA. Yeah, agenda. Uh, we'll see what is STA. Uh, physical design flow. Yes, Puneet has already explained, but yeah, we'll see where STA fits exactly into this physical design flow. Yeah, fundamentals of STA, timing analysis flow, constraints generation. And yes, yeah, I something about timing convergence in design flow, but uh, uh, depending on the time available, we'll see whether we, we will be able to cover or not. Then, uh, yeah, what is uh, static timing analysis? So basically, timing analysis can be done in two ways. So one way could have been like uh, dynamic analysis, where uh, the exact input vectors corresponding to the valid use case, they are provided to the uh, design. And it is simulated to see whether we get the desired response or not. But, but now, uh, this is, like uh, just as good as the coverage of the uh, input vectors. So uh, only the parts which get sensitized by these vectors, they get checked. So in order to cover the entire design, well, we would need a huge number of patterns. And uh, that makes this approach slow. And uh, for huge designs, yeah, it uh, it is not feasible. So the way uh, that is uh, preferred is the static. So static way here means uh, that we, there is no dependency on any test vectors or the actual uh, uh, use cases. And uh, the design is broken down into a number of timing paths and all the valid timing paths are uh, checked for uh, the uh, setup, hold, uh, minimum uh, pulse width, or, or all the criteria. So irrespective of the uh, actual use case or the pattern, the, uh, we check whether the path is robust enough and uh, can meet the timing. Uh, be uh, whatever transitioning from zero to one or one to zero, uh, or any condition. So that is uh, that way is uh, preferred, and this is called static timing analysis. So by definition, by definition, it's like ESTA is a method of uh, validating the uh, timing performance of a design by checking all 
possible timing paths for timing violations. So, uh, yeah, yeah uh, very important to say that it, it doesn't depend on a uh, test vector. So it is much faster than dynamic simulation because it does not, uh, it, it is not necessary to simulate the logical operation of the design. So oh yeah, in this analysis, we consider transitioning from one to zero and zero to one also. So that defines the static behavior. Uh, okay, in first place, why, why do we even need to worry about the timing uh, sign of checks when we, we are talking about tape out or fabricating chips? So, uh, the RTL, uh, the yeah, RTL description, it uh, doesn't have uh, timing information, except other than uh, so if that RTL uh, that IP has been used in any previous uh, chip at the same technology node, confidence is there that yeah this IP can meet one gigahertz in say 16 FFC. But other than that, it doesn't have a timing information. It is just a description. So when we actually uh, synthesize it into gate level uh, components, then here it becomes necessary that we, uh, we uh, time these uh, standard cells that are used in the design and they make up this long path or short paths. Uh, and here uh, it, uh, we need to uh, ensure that the performance needs, say suppose the path has to meet uh, one NS uh, period. So that's like uh, one gigahertz uh, frequency. So all the tasks that have been uh, uh, subtasks uh, that, that that are planned, that each sub subtask needs to be completed in one cycle period, isn't it? So yeah, just a few minutes back, Puneet was talking about yeah, breaking down the bigger tasks into smaller. So yeah, here also the uh, the the design intent is or the design process it is broken down into smaller steps. Uh, imagine a task which is broken down into hundred steps. Uh, which need to be executed sequentially. So one after the other, not parallelly, one after the other. So time allowed for each step uh, is one cycle period. So each step has to be covered in uh, say one NS. So as long as we check that each step gets done within one period uh, with all the possible uh, variable inputs, right? We'll be confident that the entire task can be executed in 100 cycles. So in order to confirm that each step can be performed in one cycle period, thorough delay analysis of each substage uh, in that step needs to be done and compared against one cycle period. So that's where this timing info or timing uh, sign off is necessary. How is ESTA done? So in fact, uh, how, how should a sign off check be done in first place? Uh, we'll need to prepare a sign of criteria based on working conditions, uh, use cases, performance needs uh, from these products. So uh, Puneet right in the beginning explained about the ADD or the design spec that comes from the say, marketing team prepares with their wish list for the product. So the architects put it together. So uh, now the sign of criteria also will have to align with the needs of the product. So bring uh, so the, uh, the you know, STA will involve bringing up a sign of environment, providing the spec in the form of timing constraints, appropriate boundary conditions, uh, timing models for suitably uh, uh, extreme conditions. So extreme conditions in uh, yeah we will come to that. We have one more slide for it. We'll explain more. Uh, electrical settings to use the timing models appropriately. And then uh, once we have the sign of environment ready, just go ahead and validate all the timing paths in the design. So uh, yeah, before going to the corner information and all, yeah, let us see where the STA team fits into the physical design flow. So STA team uh, interacts mainly with uh, these four uh, teams around it. Uh, DFT team, the front end team, uh, APR team, and the synthesis team. So here the uh, STA team needs to understand from uh, the DFT team about the uh, DFT stands for design for test. And then they have some uh, modes particular which help them in testing the silicon once it comes back. 
So for the, that, they have some prerequisites that uh, certain patterns need to be, uh, we should be able to pump them into the design and uh, take them out for observation. So uh, the, all the kind of uh, modes that they need, the STA team understands from the DFT team. Similarly, this is from the front end side. So the integration team has put uh, together so many IPs together, maybe a graphics processor, applications processor, a DDR uh, is there in the design and uh, several uh, IO interfaces uh, like Ethernet or uh, SDHC. So STA team needs to understand all the mode requirements or the specs from the front end team. And uh, so this information needs to be given to the synthesis team and the APR teams so that the uh, the uh, we, we design to the spec. In the absence, yeah, synthesis team where they would just take a RTL and synthesize in, it into a gate level netlist. But that gate level netlist, we may not be able to uh, optimize it further and get a timing close design. So constraints are very important in the uh, initial synthesis and at every stage of APR. So uh, here, once the synthesis is done, we, uh, we take some uh, collaterals from synthesis team like dot uh, V. So here is basically the net list, gate level net list. Uh, we take it and along with uh, some standard delay format file, or a dot spec file if it is a physical aware synthesis. And we time it in STA to see whether the results are as per our expectations. And if we go ahead with this kind of a, a synthesis optimized, optimized data, will we be able to take it all the way till tape out? Or uh, do we need to say that no, we'll not be able to meet this with uh, at this technology node or this voltage level doesn't support us? The, uh, uh, those kind of things will need to be discussed. But in a re regular flow, yeah, where we just uh, refine the synthesis recipe here. Uh, re refining the synthesis recipe uh, would include, uh, so if we are doing synthesis only with the HVT cells and we do not meet the timing and uh, we see that the optimization is, uh, uh, optimization would have been much better and it would have led to a design which can potentially be closed at the, uh, through APR. Then uh, we consider opening up LVT cells also during synthesis. Those kind of feedback loops happen here. Uh, here also, uh, whether the floor plan is fine, uh, whether the memories are placed uh, optimally for the timing, uh, whether the IOs uh, which interact with the external world, they are placed suitably or not. So those kind of feedbacks happen with the uh, flow plan placement, whether the clock tree is uh, good enough or not. So th those feedbacks happen in this uh, STA2 APR side. And then, uh, yeah, so even the DFT teams and the uh, front end teams, they need uh, to build confidence that whatever we are building meets their uh, functionality requirements or the DFT sanity checks. So we provide some data from uh, STA team uh, at some suitable stages back to the DFT team and front end team. Uh, they consume it uh, to build confidence. And if there are any fixes needed, they go in. Yeah, let me put everything first. Yeah, so as we discussed, constraints, yeah, go, they go into synthesis and there are there's some iterations happen here if the timing uh, is uh, looking good. So timing met is an ideal case, but usually we, we have some violations, but they are justified uh, that fine, they may not become a bottleneck at a later stage. And we move on, yeah, we move into the next stage placement. Uh, here also, when we reach a, a reasonable uh, timing QR, or it's just not the timing QR, as Puneet explained some time back, it's about the uh, routability or uh, even the placement densities or all the uh, the uh, APR related criteria. Where once everything is met, we say uh, that we are good and we can go to the next stage of CTS and routing. And at every stage, yes, there are some minute uh, changes in the constraints happening. The 
margins which need to be taken at synthesis are slightly higher because that time uh, we do not have the exact placement or the routes they are just estimates so some margins need to be taken this is explained on the last slide uh, let's see whether uh, we managed to reach there uh, cts uh, so i was here so once the clock skews clock latencies uh, setup and hold timing uh, they look fine then at one stage we say that yes we we want to exit the apr and we go into the noise analysis so noise analysis uh, mainly is like the cross talk the coupling capacitances they result in this uh, phenomena of cross talk uh, delay and cross talk noise as well so uh, we do analysis with that and if there are any problematic nets if there is any uh, uh, cross talk that is troubling us uh, as long as it doesn't trouble us much cross talk yes it can stay in the design uh but if it is high and something needs to be fixed the call is taken and the timing issue cycles uh take care of it so uh now that we have covered the uh, the just overview now we'll go into like uh, what timing collaterals are needed for uh, sta what is delay calculation uh, what are timing paths what is setup hold recovery removal uh some things like clock gating and glitch removal latency and skew late early concepts and the corners yep let's just go and the modes so a very very simple kind of a, a path shown here uh, but yeah that this one is to uh, show the first collateral that we need so is the design netlist so this design netlist tells us Uh, which net is connected to which components and which pins so uh, netlist is one of the collateral that we need for timing analysis then this gate level netlist uh, comprises of the standard cells or uh, a, a memories or some ips hard ips uh, some of the files so in order to uh, time the design and say that all the timing paths are meeting we need the uh, their their timing models so for example we have a register and uh, we we need to know that what is the uh, what is the requirement of this register so uh, what is the setup timing arc what is the hold uh, requirement of this register uh, how much is this register going to show us like clock to queue clock to queue delay time uh ev will go into details of it but yes Uh, which all arcs are valid so it do we have a arc from d to q directly uh, all this information comes from timing libraries uh, this is a liberty format uh, timing libraries then uh, so now that we uh, understood that from uh, the libraries will help us get the cell delays what do we do about the interconnect delays uh, this in green so uh, th there is a, uh, a collateral called spef uh, which contains the r and c's of these uh, interconnect nets so these are used by the sta tool uh, for delay calculation and net delays are computed so spef is the third collateral constraints constraints tell us that what is the time available for this path so this is one sub task so this sub task has to say suppose meet in uh, one cycle or two cycle uh, all that information comes from uh, the constraints which are written in like sdc format and uh, it, the most important part of that is like one cycle of what one cycle of 1 gigahertz one cycle of 2 gigahertz so the uh, clock definitions and the clock frequencies and to differentiate any false paths or static paths uh, suitable exceptions so we have those uh, that information coming in the subsequent slides delay calculation so uh, how does the tool compute the net delay from z to a so this spef file that we talked about has uh, information about has information of this rnc uh, network of this net so uh, prime time delay uh, prime time which is a, our sta tool or for that matter any any other sta tool uh, from other vendors it uses this uh, rc information from the spec and it computes the net delay 
cell delay is a function of uh, input pin transition and output pin load. So here, so say, yeah, assume that this is a buffer. Uh, it, it has to uh, send the data from A to Z. So uh, signal transitions from A to Z. How much delay is it going to take to travel from A to Z? Depends on how sharply the signal is transitioning at A. So that is that is called this input pin transition or input pin slew. How sharp is this uh, transition? Then uh, how much of load is there on this output pin? Does it have to drive like 100 pins and a huge capacitance? So uh, in that case, it will take so much of time to uh, charge all those capacitances. If it is a smaller capacitance, it can charge quickly. So well, yeah, no, take away from here is yeah the cell delay depends on the input slew and the output load. So this is just a screenshot from a lib library to show uh, how this information is available in timing library Liberty format. So it has uh, this information is in the form of a lookup table. So here uh, the lookup table which is picked up is like eight by eight, and the index one stands for input net transition and total out. Uh, the uh, the second index is for uh, output net capacitance. So uh, now the STA tool has the information that for say 0 0.011 of uh, net transition and output load of 0 0.0027, uh, the cell fault delay would be around. 231 PS. Uh, I'm assuming that this is in EMS. And so at the header of the dot, uh, Liberty file, the units are uh, clearly uh, written out. That what is the uh, uh, unit for uh, timing, uh, so, uh, say period, and what is the uh, unit for capacitance? The, all that information is written in the header of the uh, Liberty file. So here uh, it's like rows and columns. So the index one goes in like uh, different rows. So for example, if you have to pick up something like fourth uh, from, from this one and the third uh, from the index two, then that is your combination. So uh, 0 0.1614 of input transition and uh, 0 0.00912 of uh, loading, that is effective capacitance seen by the uh, output pin. Then you would have to go to fourth row and the third, so that would be 368 PS. But uh, yeah, usually the real time uh, transition and the capacitances they wouldn't exactly go and fit into this. So there can be something intermediate, say 0 0.09, which is not mentioned here. So then the uh, interpolation algorithms are present in the STA tool, which uh, use this lower uh, lookup table and interpolate to a, a appropriate delay. Yeah, uh, some time back I was talking about the design needs to be broken down into timing paths. Uh, yeah, and uh, maybe these timing paths uh, are like uh, four category of paths. So first, let's say that each timing path sh uh, should have a, a start point and uh, an end point. So uh, the, they, they become the references for the timing check. Start points. Start points are these input port. Uh, Shall I go to uh, input ports and uh, the clock pins of registers? These are considered as the valid start points for a timing path. Okay, start point. So when we say start point, start point, this uh, usually means like start point for data path because actually the clock path begins some uh, for quite some uh, uh, stages above that. But yes, the uh, start point is the uh, here, uh, the clock of a register. Endpoints are the D pins or the receiving pins of the register or the output ports. And here, uh, yeah, the four types. You can have like in to out path, then in to register path, register to output path, and register to register path. So these are basically four categories of paths. Okay. <laughs> This is the actually most important slide of this uh, presentation. So set up and hold, yeah, everybody would have heard and understood the importance of these checks. Right. So 
imagine there are three registers and uh, these gray balls in the middle, they, they need to do some processing based on some intelligent inputs from somewhere, then they, they have to process the, the data that comes into it and provide the processed information to the uh, next stage. Now, just for um, making it simple, let us say that this is an uh, apple and this is a banana. Now, uh, what needs to happen is this apple needs to be processed in one cycle and the processed banana, uh, apple should be available at the door of this B after that cycle. And this banana should be processed and should be available at the, uh, uh, the door of uh, C. Let us say our cycle is like uh, one hour and now it is. Uh, so, and these are all edge triggered registers. So uh, Puni tried to explain some time back what is the difference between sequential and combinational, right? So this is one type of sequential cell which, which opens the, its door only on an edge. It is not level sensitive, it is edge triggered. So exactly at say four o'clock, the edge came and then the data uh, moved from, uh, it came into uh, CK to Q. So that is the arc that uh, we consider for timing. And the, the data uh, moved to the other side, it entered, it was processed and uh, it should be available at the door of the B pin before five o'clock. So this is the, the red edge is like, uh, you can consider it like uh, five o'clock. So we'll, uh, once again, four o'clock, and then before five o'clock, it has to be available here. So before five o'clock, how much time does it have to be available here so that it can be uh, taken correctly by this uh, B? That is the library setup time. So it's depicted this way. So uh, from here, this is a suppose four o'clock, this is five o'clock, it started from here and it had to be available before this blue region. Okay, so th that tells us the uh, setup time requirement. So minimum time for which a stable data should be available at D pin before clock transition. Okay, uh, coming to hold. So yeah, here in fact, before going to hold, we could have discussed one more thing. That, that what would have happened if this uh, processed apple was not had not reached here before the set setup time requirement of this? Then it would be something same. Uh, it it can result in something like meta stable uh, situation. That here this B does not know uh, w w what to do or uh, what kind of. Uh, yeah, uh, it opened the door, but it did not. It was not able to capture the uh, data properly. So that is called meta stability for uh, from setup side also. Then, oh yeah, hold, hold check is so now again the same thing, and but now here it is only about the same edge. So there is again that uh, apple available at the uh, door of A. And there is a banana uh, available at the door of B. Okay, now we, yeah, it's four o'clock now. Okay, it's four o'clock. So at four o'clock, suddenly all this, uh, this, uh, this apple came into A, it got processed, and it, it was able to enter into B even before B had actually captured its banana and processed it. So a and B have both reached B and the data is corrupted now. Now B does not know whether it is a banana or it is a apple. So this is a whole scenario. Uh, but yeah, please take my apple and banana things uh, cautiously because in the digital world, it is only zero and one. And uh, yeah, so even when yeah, something is something doesn't reach B, then it retains its older values. So please keep those uh, basics of uh, digital design with you and uh, do, yeah, do not uh, yeah, take my apples and bananas so seriously. Okay. So what is hold time then? So hold time, uh, minimum time for which the stable data should be available at D pin after uh, clock transition. Yeah, so he, in this case, it wasn't. 
uh, this data got corrupted by the Apple. This signal couldn't stay stable here, right? Okay, that's the whole check. Yeah, uh, so now when we say, now everything should be in the reference, right? So say, now here, A, B, and C, they are clocked by the same uh, same source. So they're so uh, they're, uh, they do not have any phase shift between them. So when when we say one hour, one hour, one hour, all the, uh, the time zones are same, and they are talking only about 60 minutes hour. So all, all the things are uh, consistent here. So there is no problem. At what time it starts? Say, um, it can start at like 4:15, uh, uh, and the next cycle will come at 5:15. So it's like one hour cycle. So it's all aligned here. There is no problem. This is called synchronous clock because the source is same and the uh, beginning of the clock is all aligned. So it's not like the clock to A has a different beginning. The clock at B has a different beginning. It's the same common source that is uh, feeding to all the registers. So that, that, that's where this slide talks about. The clock should be synchronous for genuine setup and hold checks. So we, we have some different kind of checks for asynchronous, but you are not within the scope of this. Supposing the clock one and clock two, uh, they, they, they are not aligned with each other. So here, yeah, although it shows like both are starting at the same time, uh, but it could so happen that this one starts at uh, some time. So whenever this person wakes up in the morning, he opens the door and that is where his uh, timer starts. Uh, the other register, yeah, he, he wakes up at whatever time he opens his door and from there onwards, he is very periodic that after every one hour, he'll open the door. But the starting uh, the uh, starting phase, phase relationship doesn't exist. So that is asynchronous. Okay. So uh, how would the timing look like? So if these periods are also not kind of, or they do not have any relation like uh, uh, integral multiple of eight or so if it is just D2 and uh, D4, and uh, and of course, again, from the same clock, then it makes sense we can actually time them. Uh, but yeah, here uh, there is no relationship and these are to be considered as asynchronous. But yeah, if we tell the STA tool, if we give a tool uh, this kind of clock definition, CLK1 and CLK2, it will consider them as synchronous and all the timing paths between them are valid and it will try to do the uh, checks like this. So in the most uh, pessimistic way, so setup, which is the tightest one. So uh, launch here and launch here. So this one becomes the setup critical path. And uh, for hold, does it take this path? No, for hold, it would take the uh, severe one. So uh, the you know, STA tools, in the absence of very, very clear guidelines, always are pessimistic and they consider the worst scenarios. Uh, what is recovery and removal? So some process is set up and it is going on. Uh, and it is going on very, very nicely. All, all the cycle subtasks are going on, but suddenly there, there is some condition where you want to just reset it. Uh, you, you want you want to stop the uh, functioning uh, for some reason. Then there should be a way to uh, go into the reset mode. So reset can happen at any time uh, asynchronously, but its uh, deassertion has to be timed and. Uh, so certain checks need to be taken care of. So example, so here, this lower one is the uh, reset signal and this is the clock. So with reference to the clock, so uh, that there is just like the whole time, the reset signal shouldn't be deasserted in the removal time or the recovery time. Otherwise, the design will not get uh, uh, will not be recovered into a known step uh, stage again. So these are recovery and removal. These are with respect to the reset signals.
what are clock gating checks? So uh, yeah, here. Yeah, again, one analogy. So yeah, whenever my mummy is here uh, in my place, so I tell the diagnostic center person to send his person for uh, blood sample collection at uh, 7 a.m. Uh, in the morning every Saturday. And he charges me for every visit. Okay, so uh, and he keeps coming, a uh, very good guy, always at 6 a.m. comes. But when my mummy goes to my village back for two, three months, then I don't want to keep paying this guy to come knock at my door and hear a no, uh, mummy is not there and then go back. Not needed, right? So that's where this, this kind of a clock getting uh, is, uh, comes into play. That I tell the person that unless I give you an enable signal again, uh, you don't come for well, the next two, three months. Well, I, I don't have to give a timeline. Uh, we just say that, yeah, unless I give you uh, enable signal, uh, you stop coming. So that saves his uh, or my money. That saves my money. Uh, so how does it relate here? So uh, th this register, this register, uh, there wasn't, it wasn't expecting a change in its data. We know that. We know that this uh, uh, th th there is some logic here and which is not operational uh, and uh, it is not expecting a newer data here. So uh, why simply keep that uh, clock toggling and uh, burn power? So it makes sense stopping the clock here at this point so that the uh, whatever uh, the repeaters from here onwards, they do not toggle. This register also doesn't uh, have that internal uh, switching happening here. So uh, for this clock gating checks, uh, clock gating is inserted. Wh whatever I explained, it was for uh, why, why clock gating and how it helps. But now when we put it, uh, when we have such kind of a circuitry, now it becomes important that we do some timing checks. Timing checks to ensure that uh, some undesired glitch doesn't come, which gets uh, interpreted by this register as a genuine one. So supposing if we have a uh, end, uh, the clocking uh, type getting then and so here if you just digital high high then it results in a uh, trigger here right and this one gets uh, uh, this register where when it gets this signal it thinks that the actual clock has come and uh, it doesn't even uh, yeah the, the data at that time may not be proper so the right way to uh, the, what is the check needed here that the Enable has to, uh, enable can go high only when the clock is in low stage. So in that case, the ECK, ECK is the output of this clock gate. ECK is still like a proper full pulse width and everything is fine. So here, uh, uh, no wrong data getting captured or no enough time for the path. Uh, such kind of scenarios do not exist. Okay, but by the way, I have a lot of slides still. Uh, I, I just uh, try to uh, run through fast. Clock gating checks. So similar to end, uh, we, we can have all type of gating, but here the only difference would be uh, that the now ECK should uh, can uh, change. Uh, no, no, no. Can you, you know, conclude this already? You know, <laughs> ten minutes over. <laughs> okay, okay. Sorry. So, Go ahead. Ah, uh, no, no. Yeah, yeah. That's. Yeah. We will conclude with this slide. Maybe. Uh, I try to maybe conclude. Yeah. Okay. Two, three As minutes. Uh, Fine. Yeah. Some just a minute. Let me see. Yeah, and we covered that. So some of the important checks again are like pulse width checks. Uh, high pulse width, low pulse width. So these are the characteristics of the sequential components that in order to operate uh, uh, as, per, uh, as per our expectations, uh, the minimum pulse widths of this clock uh, need, need to be honored. Like the uh, clock degradation happens if the clock tree is built with uh, not balanced cells. Say suppose the rise rise edge has higher delays compared to a fall edge. Then the right, uh, the over 10 stages, the high pulse width will go on shrinking. 
So uh, if it shrinks beyond beyond the limit, then the sequential component may not be able to operate. What's clock latency? Clock latency, as Puneet has explained very nicely in his CTS stage. So yeah, let me just run through. Yeah, only one point here. So yes, uh, the uh, source sitting far may, may not be able to drive the uh, register, the clock registers clock pin. So it needs these charging stations on the way, which are like repeaters. Yeah, so uh, at the source, the clock uh, looked at this, right? So uh, the ideal clock says suppose four o'clock, but then actually by the time it reached here, it, is, it was like four o'clock and ten minutes. So that ten minutes is the latency here. Skew. Skew also has been covered in detail by uh, uh, Puneet. And yeah, he explained also uh, that uh, it can help set up uh, in uh, it, uh, it can help set up in some uh, for some parts. It can uh, uh, help hold for some parts, but at the expense of the other. Yeah, so this is one important slide I would like to cover. Uh, what is SI? What is signal integrity? Analysis of changes. Uh, in the quality of a signal due to transitions on neighboring uh, signals. So yeah, it's just like a bad company um, uh, impacts us. So here also, if you have some signal which is transitioning in opposite direction to the signal of uh, our interest, uh, then uh, yeah, it uh, impacts our speed. So let me go in order. What is glitch noise? Uh, glitch noise, uh, and glitch noise is dangerous. It can cause functional failures. Consider a victim signal. Uh, this black one is the victim signal, and the red one is the aggressor. So this black signal was supposed to be uh, quiet, like at uh, static zero, uh, static zero value. But this neighboring signal suddenly had a, a very sharp transition, zero to one, a strong one. So because of the coupling capacitances here, a voltage bump is seen on this uh, victim net, and if that uh, if that voltage bump is good, meaning strong enough and big enough uh, in width as well as height, it can propagate all the way till the end point and may get misinterpreted as a wrong value. So uh, that is a functional failure. This is called glitch noise. The delay noise. So uh, even say suppose this this particular signal did not result in a functional failure. Like it, okay, it was a very small bump and it died off uh, in the uh, uh, on the way, or maybe the uh, this register's tolerance was high and it is within the allowable limit. No problem. The other thing that uh, we still have to consider in timing is the uh, delay noise. But slightly different case. Now imagine the victim net as well as the aggressor nets, uh, both transitioning. If both transition in the same direction, then the uh, our victim sees us, uh, a faster uh, net delay. And if the uh, signal is in the opposite direction, the uh, net, net delay increases. So this needs to be accounted for in the STA because one yeah, speeding up uh, of a data path can impact hold and uh, delaying of a signal, a data signal can uh, impact setup. So with uh, maybe this one can be the slide where we can conclude. This looks like a good uh, uh, concluding slide here. PVT delay dependencies. So sometime back we, we were talking about the working conditions and preparing the sign of environment. Uh, right. So uh, here, uh, what are the timing libraries that we would be needing for our uh, confident sign off? Supposing, uh, yeah, the, it is decided to uh, fabricate a chip in 16 FFC, and then uh, uh, the foundry, foundry also is decided, and foundry, foundry tells their processes. So, what, what is the process? Uh, usually, ESS, EFF, TT. These are the processes we talk about. Uh, what is the first alphabet? Uh, so, our, of yes, yes. What is the first yes mean? First, yes means that is the process of the unmost portion of the device. Uh, what what kind of process did that see during fabrication? Uh, the second alphabet is the process of uh, PMOS fabrication. So it's uh, since there are multiple uh, masks uh, involved in the fabrication and multiple uh, stages, all the all the stages may not see a uniform process. 
so for example metal 1 can get fabricated in uh, some process metal 2 may see a different process and uh, but yeah we, when we are talking about ss and ff it is basically about the base layers so that's about the process the, the process if the process is good then we'll see lesser delays so eff uh, devices will have lesser delays voltage now uh, the performance needs of the design are such that the uh, design has to be powered by say suppose 0.8 volts from the power supply then will all the standard cells uh, see 0.8 volts at their uh, power rails follow pins uh, no there, there, there are uh, 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 there, there is ir drop that comes into play uh, then uh, sometimes there is a voltage overshoot so in order to be uh, to to bound uh, the uh, conditions like corresponding to 0.8 volts we consider 0.72 that is minus 10% and plus 10% uh, for timing analysis or for that matter even for term, and yeah this is related to the power uh, di uh, distribution network analysis also where they consider uh, these numbers to decide their vo allowable voltage drops temperature so yeah temperature i think yeah this uh, this is important so this was in the older uh, technology nodes where low te lower temperatures uh, resulted in lesser delays but with the uh, in uh, lower technology nodes the fundamentals have reversed uh, and uh, the, the, you, you can read about it on in google uh, temperature inversion effects in lower technology nodes yeah, uh, with that, uh, now Mamani, should we uh, conclude here? Hello? Uh, I think Manish is away. So, yeah, till the time Manish comes back, I can continue, I guess. So, yeah, one thing is defining the library corners. Uh, that we talked about, then defining the RC corners, the uh, wire parasitic corners. The wires can be fabricated. Uh, it, wires also may see different processes like RC worst, RC best, or C best, right? And uh, the, uh, the temperatures, temperatures uh, for for any given product whether uh, well, what should be the uh, operating conditions some of the devices need to uh, be sitting very close to the engines with 125c or 150c as their temperatures and uh, they may need to be operating in colder regions as well with minus 40. so we need to analyze the design in both the extreme conditions so uh, we we decide our uh, uh, pvt corners based on that Yeah, but I think, uh, yeah, even Q&A, <laughs> what's up, Nick? Uh, Manish or someone, someone here to... Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, Manish. So uh, I think, yeah, this is like a good slide to conclude from my side. 